Okay, the twin paradox now part four. I want to do a brief review of where we've been with this. And uh, also, as you can see, we're going to do something with the Lorentz transformation here. If this is going to distract you, I'd suggest pause uh, the video right now, write that down, and then uh, so you can focus on uh, other things we're going to be talking about here, and we'll get to this in a, in a few minutes. But remember, here's, here's the situation in a smaller diagram this time. We had uh, Alice in the rocket going at 0.6c, gamma factor of 1.25, Bob in the lab frame. And, and this time we're going to specifically talk about the rocket and lab frame. And as you can see again over the equations here, we've got R and L standing for rocket and lab. Not right and left, but rocket and uh, lab, just to try to keep things straight here. Because sometimes we've had Alice moving and sometimes we've had Bob moving in previous um, analyses and examples. And so sometimes if we just keep using A and B, Alice and Bob, then we forget who's moving and who isn't. It gets even more confusing, perhaps. So... Alice is moving this time in the, the rocket frame. Uh, we measure things in light years and years and um, went out to a, a star three light years away and then traveled back again. So here's what Alice's world line looks like in Bob's frame of reference. So out to three light years and then back. So back in, in the uh, negative direction, leftward direction, and ends up uh, according to Bob, 10 years later, five, he observes her, takes five years to get to the star. Five years times 0.6 times the speed of light is three light years, and then another five years back. So his analysis, remember, was fairly straightforward. He expects, uh, he'll see 10, light year, 10 years tick off on his clock, and because of uh, time dilation, factor, the 1.25, 1 over gamma factor, he sees Alice's clocks tick off four years in, in each case. And then we did the analysis, uh, so that was Bob's analysis via time dilation. We did Alice's analysis where she sees Bob essentially going away and the star coming toward her and then uh, back again. And for that, it was a little more complicated. We had to use not only time dilation, but length contraction because she sees the distance to the star, not as three light years as Bob does, but a contracted distance. So we had to take that into account. And, and once we did that, we got uh, the correct number of years ticking off on her clock, four years. And then, though, the, the real puzzle was, you know, we, we also saw that Alice, of course, saw Bob's clocks running more slowly. And so, and the number we got for that was 3.2 years, again, the gamma factor, four years on Alice's clocks. She sees Bob's clocks ticking more slowly. Uh, compared to her lattice of clocks she compared it to, by a factor of 1.25, which would leave 3.2 years. So why doesn't Alice see Bob only age 6.4 years? And remember, the key was that when we analyze the turnaround here, essentially Alice is changing frames of reference. And so her lines of simultaneity were parallel to this, the green dashed line that slopes down like this. And when she changes, frame of re changes frames of reference, then uh, her lines of simultaneity are parallel this way. And at that turnaround, there's a jump that takes place between uh, frames of references and frames of reference, and therefore Bob's clocks speed up compared to Alice's clocks at that point and tick, tick faster, as it were. You can actually delve into the details of that turnaround and, uh, and analyze it and show in more detail if, if you want that that actually occurs. But for our purposes, we just say, hey, change it in frame of reference. Therefore, we can see on our diagrams that we did that we get this jump in, in time from 3.2 years up to 6.8 years. And then during the second part leg of the trip, again, Bob's clocks, as far as Alice observes, tick off 3.2 years. Add it all together and you get 10 years. So both of them come up with the same answers, although by different uh, reasoning with that. Uh, another thing just to, to mention here, and that is because some of you are probably still thinking, well, it just seems that Aren't they symmetrical? In other words, you know, Bob watches Alice go away and come back in. Alice in her spaceship from her frame of reference watches Bob go that way, the star come this way, and then back again. Um, you know, just think about it. It seems very symmetrical. But we made the point that only Alice has the acceleration involved. And Bob actually does not feel any acceleration. We, we mentioned, of course, like if you're in a car that's accelerating, you can feel it being pushed back in the seat or decelerating, you're thrown forward a little bit, or even moving side to side around a, around a curve. Uh, another maybe more uh, physics way of doing that is to do a simple experiment. Drop a ball. 
And if you're moving at constant velocity motion, and there's no wind or anything like that, if you drop a ball, it will drop right down at your, at your feet because the ball participates. Again, we're talking about slower speeds here. We obviously did the analysis with relativistic speeds, but the ball participates in the motion of, uh, of the object as you're moving. Uh, if you're accelerating, however, what happens is the ball falls behind you for a large enough acceleration. Uh, for a smaller acceleration, it actually does, but you just can't notice it as much. And so essentially what happens is as you drop it, the ball has the velocity at that point, so it will be going forward with you, but you sort of accelerate it out from underneath it, and therefore it falls behind, falls behind you. Or if you decelerate, it falls ahead of you because it still has that initial velocity. You're, you've slowed down now, and so it moves ahead of you. So Bob could do that dropping ball experiment all he wants, and during this whole time, it would just fall at his feet. He would not undergo acceleration, whereas Alice would um, when she was at the turnaround point, decelerating and accelerating. So if that helps a little bit to see what's going on, that it, even though it seems symmetrical, it actually is not. And, of course, the acceleration or deceleration acceleration at the turnaround point is the key factor because that's what changes the frames of reference for Alice. And then you get the, the, the jump going on there the jump in time as Alice observes Bob's clock. So in one sense, we've talked about how special theory of relativity is all about inertial frames of reference, only applies to that, not in cases of acceleration and deceleration. But you really don't need, say, the general theory of relativity here, which deals with acceleration and deceleration, because uh, you just assume the acceleration and deceleration occurs over a short enough time that you can essentially analyze it using the special theory and it's really the change in reference frame, which is covered by the special theory, that gives us the, the results here. So yes, acceleration, deceleration is involved, but we can analyze the results and get the correct results using the special theory. So uh, all that being said, uh, what about the Lorentz transformation here? What we want to show is that you can get the same numbers using the Lorentz transformation, perhaps a little faster as well. The downside is... First of all, you've got to use the correct formulas, of course, the correct versions of the formulas, so you've got to be careful about that. But the downside is you don't get as much feel for what's going on uh, as you do when you break it down via time dilation, length contraction, and uh, leading clocks lag, the relativity of simultaneity. But I do want to show that you can uh, do this. Again, uh, our basic equation that we suggested you, you memorize, if, if you're in the mood for, for that and want to use this a lot, is this one here where uh, we have the rocket moving away in a positive x direction, L4 lab. And one way to memorize whether, or remember whether it's a plus or minus here is just think about, okay, the rocket's moving away from me if I'm in the lab. That means any rocket value for x will be a bigger value for me because it's moved away. And so if they measure something 10 meters ahead of them, that's going to be maybe 30 meters for me if they've moved 20 meters in that time. So if you can remember that basic situation, rocket moving away, uh, it's going to be a plus sign here in the basic forms of the equation. Then from that, you can uh, derive pretty easily just in your head that uh, the other forms of the equation here. So let's start, though, over here with, with A, calculating analysis results using Bob's values. And so Bob, Bob's values are the lab frame values. And to Alice here, Bob is moving in the negative x direction uh, to the left. And that's why we've got minus signs in these versions. But otherwise, Bob's values, the reason it's, it's nice to start off with that, is Bob's values are, are, um, are pretty obvious what's going on here. So on the outbound trip, uh, Bob's you know, value right here is x, I'll just put this in, so we'll say x l equals three light years, right, right there, and then the time is five, five years, tl equals five years. And so that's for the outbound trip. So the question is, okay, those are Bob's measurements right there. What are the measurements X and T for Alice in the rocket at that point? And if you um, plug the numbers in here, you know, gamma is 1.25, plug these values in for XL and TL, V is 0.6C, we're using C equals one because we're doing light years per year for C. Plug that all in and you'll find you get zero for here and you get four for that. And think a minute, does that make sense? Well, yes, because this is Alice's world line, right? She, in her frame of reference, hasn't moved. She's at zero in her frame of reference. And 
her clocks tick off four years, and that's what we got before. So uh, yes, that does make sense there. Now we'll get to the inbound trip in a minute. That's a little trickier. Let's do the outbound trip for uh, Bob's results using Alice's values. Okay, well, uh, we could either do Alice's analysis as we did with uh, the length contraction time dilation or even just use these results here. We know that Alice here is going to be XR at the turnaround point there at the planet or star. XR equals 0. TR equals 4. And uh, you plug those values in and you get, as you should, 3 and 5. In other words, Bob's measurement of that space-time point is XL equals 3, XL equals 3 light years, and time 5, 5 years there. So that checks out, as it should. Now what about the inbound trip here? We have to be a little careful here because these Lorentz transformation equations apply when the origin is uh, the same for both, both of them. In other words, you know, when we're starting things at the origin and at that point, Bob's clock and measurement, clocks and measurements are at zero and same thing for Alice's, then these equations apply. In this case, we're out here. Our starting point is out here at the point three, five, and we're going back to the left. So what we have to do to make it easy to use our, our uh, general equations here is to redefine this as the origin point and then what, what happens here is, if you think about it, if this now is our new 0, 0 point, just for the second leg, the inbound leg analysis right there, that means, if we think about it, uh, XL is going to be negative 3. Okay? So this is now 0, count off negative 3 back to here. And so we can write uh, XL equals negative 3 in there. And TL is the same. TL still goes 5, up 5. So it's really negative 3 TL equals 5 years. And if you plug in those values, negative 3 and TL L equals 5, just from the diagram here, uh, again, you're going, to get, uh, you're going to get XR equals 0 and TR equals 4, another 4 years, as you would expect. So 8 years there. And same thing... Uh, inbound trip over here, although uh, in this case we just use XR, again, XR equals 0 and TR equals 4. We've redefined the origin to be 0. So, and again, on the rocket ship for Alice, she's just at 0. She hasn't, hasn't moved as far as she's concerned. And uh, TR equals 4. And you plug those in. And notice what happens here. For this one, actually, you get XL equals negative 3, okay, and TL equals 5 again. And, and so you say, well, wait a minute, XL equals negative 3. Well, remember, again, we've defined this as the origin, so really, um, as far as Bob is concerned, Alice has moved negative 3 in the uh, negative direction, in the left direction. Okay, and, and once again, L and R here are not left and right. They stand for lab and rocket. So it just shows us, yes, we can get the same answers using the Lorentz transformation as long as we're careful with our plus and minus signs and think about the origin for the inbound leg there. Um, let's also, one other way we could do this, just to review a number of things we've done in the past and use for calculations, and that is the invariant interval. So let's just do uh, quickly put that up here and see how that, that works and get the same results, or we should. Okay, so remember the, the basic form of our invariant interval equation between uh, two space-time points essentially is uh, c squared delta t. Uh, and here, well, again, we'll use lab and, um, and rocket frame again. So L and R. Uh, so we'll just do L squared minus, let's use de delta x just to remind ourselves it's a difference in coordinates, dex, delta XL squared equals C squared delta TR squared minus delta X R squared. And again, what's nice if we're using everything in, in uh, light years per year, light seconds per second, then C just becomes 1. So we don't have to worry about the, the Cs there, and we're just looking at the difference in uh, the time coordinates. And so for the outbound trip, uh, outbound. 
Uh, for the outbound trip, we have delta XL is 3. Okay, so let's write that down, delta XL. Now is it goes to 3 minus 0, so difference is 3 light years. In uh, this case, uh, delta TL, again, we're assuming we've done Bob's analysis. Delta TL is 5 years for the outbound case. And the other nice thing about uh, sometimes with the invariant interval, if we're doing delta XR for Alice, as we've already mentioned a couple times, that's just zero, right? Because she stays, from her frame of reference, she's not moving. She's just in, uh, in her spaceship. And so we can see we have everything we need here. So we've got delta XL and delta T sub L. Uh, we have delta XR over here, which is zero, so that disappears. And so we're just left with delta R and uh, when you do that, plug in the numbers here, we get delta T uh, sub R equals 4. It's easy to, to verify that if you want. Uh, so that's the outbound trip. Uh, for the inbound trip, very similar again. So again, you, you can see here, even, it's an even easier calculation than the Lorentz transformation if you know uh, the values. And depending on how, what the situation is, sometimes it's very easy to see what those are. Um, but you lose the insight behind it. And that's why we started off using, not, first we, we did our diagrams, the space-time diagrams, and then did our analysis with uh, time dilation and so on and so forth. Now for the inbound, notice what happens here is, it, as far as Bob is concerned, it, uh, Alice ends up at zero and starts at three. So in this case, delta XL is negative three. You do the the second point minus the first point. Zero minus three is, is negative three there. Uh, delta TL, though, equals five again. Delta XR is zero again. And once again, you get really the same thing. You get delta TR equals four when you, when you work that out. Um, so that's the, the invariant interval approach to this. Again, it can be useful in certain cases just to get a quick answer uh, if you need it. Now, uh, one final uh, point here to make or remark, and that is we've mentioned a couple times about experimental results that confirm all this because no matter how many thought experiments we do like this, we, there's always the, the lingering doubt that, you know, is this really real? Does it, does it happen this way? Um, it, it seems logical once you starting from Einstein's principles and sort of building on those, and yes, we can see how with a light clock, we get time dilation, length interaction, relativity, simultaneity. But because it's so far out of our everyday experience, it's sometimes just hard to, hard to know. So I, I mentioned, for example, the muon experiment. Uh, they've also done experiments with muons in particle accelerators where they essentially have uh, some muons just at rest and then other muons circling around them. And from those, they can show that the, the particles uh, at rest will decay faster uh, than those in, in motion. So again, it shows the clocks slow down for the ones in motion. So that's well, well, uh, well understood and demonstrated. But I've also mentioned the, these airline um, experiments they've done. The first one, just if you're interested a little bit in this, it was done in uh, 1971, I believe where they, took, they had uh, two accurate atomic clocks on the ground, and then they took some portable ones up in commercial airliners, actually, and flew around. And some flew eastbound, some flew westbound. And they had to take into account a number of things going on, including the, the rotation of the Earth and the fact that um, clocks actually run, more, uh, run faster at higher altitudes than lower altitudes in a gravitational field like, like the Earth's effect. Next week, we'll talk just a little bit about that to see how time dilation occurs in a gravitational field. So they, they had to take those things into account as well as the velocity of, of the airplanes. And, and the eastbound and westbound was a little different because Earth was moving and therefore the clocks on the ground were not completely stationary, but they were moving on the Earth and so on and so forth with that. So what did they find? won't give you all the numbers here, but to give you an idea, for the westbound clocks that went on the, on the planes, they uh, had uh, a prediction of uh, that the difference between the clocks and 
the, uh, the stationary clock, stationary in the sense they were still on the ground, was 275 plus or minus 21 nanoseconds. That was the, the prediction. The result was uh, 273 plus or minus, uh, I think it was about 7 nanoseconds, something like that. Uh, so pretty close. The eastbound result wasn't quite as good as that. But uh, this was, you know, they predicted the clocks that flew around would run more slowly than the clocks on the ground by this amount. And they, the experimental result was, was very close to it. They actually re repeated this in 1996, a form of this experiment where they, they had, by that time they had better atomic clocks, you know, about 25 years later. And they, they took one on a, uh, a jetliner from Washington, D.C. to London and back again. And the prediction there for the result was uh, about 30, almost 40 nanoseconds, I think 39.8 nanoseconds. And the result was, um, was about, I think, 39 plus or minus 2 nanoseconds. You don't have to remember these numbers, of course. But the point is they're getting results that are very close to the experimental or the theoretical predictions. And also just the fact that these are very, very small um, uh, time amounts here. Nano, billions of a second are what nanoseconds are. They've also done in, in the intervening years, since 1996, not that long ago actually, but there's an experiment done in uh, 2010 at the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. Uh, yeah, NIST, which is in Boulder, Colorado in the United States. Other countries have, have these things, uh, have these institutes as, as well that uh, are in charge of standards and making very precise measurements and things like that. So in the United States, it's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It used to be the National Bureau of, of Standards, but they changed the name a while back. Anyway, 2010, they did an experiment with a very, very accurate form of clock that uh, they had developed. And instead of taking it on a jet airline or anything, they could just do it within the lab at, at various speeds, even as low as four meters per second. Okay, so that's about 12, 12 feet uh, per second, if you're, you know, I think in those terms, uh, up to maybe about 90 miles an hour. So they did a variety of speeds, but slow speeds. We're not talking about jetliner speeds. And they, the, the experimental results matched up nearly perfectly within the very small air bars they had to the predictions of the special theory of relativity. So the theory of relativity is, is well understood theoretically. It's uh, well supported experimentally doesn't mean that uh, it's possible we could discover something that um, meant we had to change a little bit. Maybe the speed of light isn't constant over the time of the universe or, th or things like that. And every once in a while in the news, you'll hear something about some experiment that says, you know, maybe something travels faster than the speed of light. These experiments are so subtle, though, that often there are confounding factors that you have to take care of and take into account. And it's very difficult at the precision involved to, to really see if something is going on or not. And so far, every time, Einstein, in a sense, the theory has been proven correct. Okay, so that's uh, the twin paradox, most famous paradox of all, and just some of the analyses we've, we've done in various ways with it, and then just the experimental results that show, yes, no matter how weird it seems, the twin paradox actually is an experimentally proven fact.